Hi, this is uh, James Taliansic here from uh, Taliansic Wines. Just um, giving you a quick look at my workspace, which has been my workspace for um, the last 43 years. Uh, some old bourbon barrels here that we use for our 30 year old rare tawny. Um, across the top of these old concrete vats that have um, all wax line concrete vats that we used to use some years ago. It was one of my jobs as a young guy, uh, jumping in the top of these and uh, WorkSafe would love me. Um, uh, being able to hop in and um, with a blowtorch and with a suction fan and um, uh, putting on a new layer of uh, uh, beeswax on the inside of these tanks. What an amazing job that was. Um, I'm not sure if my dad was trying to teach me something or trying to punish me, but, um, but he did it for 35 or 40 years, so I thought, well, I can do it as well. So um, that was just, uh, <laughs> that's part of uh, my first 10, 15 years of my, of my life working here, mm -hmm. um, learning about uh, waxing the inside of concrete tanks. This is, uh, well, first of all, this is, these are my work boots for the past 15 years or 18 years. And uh, um, I'm about six foot six tall and um, I played basketball for many years and uh, I find it very, very difficult to find size 14 and a half or 15 shoes. Um, but I do have one company in Perth that can find them for me. And, uh, and that's my, my few years of work, the few steps that have been taken in them. Now this is inside one of our work areas that we would spend a great deal of time during the winter months doing our blending. Um, such an important part of fortified wines. So this is a raw tin shed, as you can see, that has to be this way. Some parts of the world, they even keep them outside, but, um, and just with a roof on them. But we have our refrigeration units in here as well throughout the year that controls our temperature for our reds and our cool room and our whites. And um, so it blows out warm air most of the year round and keeps this room at about, um, uh, even in winter time, above 30 degrees. In summertime, probably more like 45. Um, so we don't work here in summer but all of our blending trials are done during the winter months, which is coming up shortly. That's our stack of, one of our stacks of old liqueur Shiraz, which is this wine here, um, which has done so well for us. That's an old 1980, and we've just released the 81. Now, up here we have some old English oak barrels that my grandfather made, uh, the late Jack Rubber, so um, my grandfather from my mother's side, who was a cooper and a winemaker. Um, of course, even during my father's time, there was hardly a, hardly a restaurant in Perth, let alone a wine writer. Uh, so um, these people didn't get a lot of publicity for what they did until around about the late 60s and 70s. Um, where the wine industry started to boom and everyone wants, wanted to be a part of you know, the wine industry, the wine writers, wine judges, and of course, wine makers. And plantings went through the roof and, um, and now we have this wonderful industry in Australia that, that exports wines all around the world. Um, you can see in the background there, I can't get through that spot, but in the background we have our upright coos, which hold four and a half thousand litres each, uh, upright tanks made of French oak. Um, always remember the day they arrived on the back of a truck wrapped up in plastic. Um, they have a stainless steel door at the front, they've got a dome-shaped top, extremely difficult to make. 
they're made in Bordeaux in France and uh, and we've been using them in here for um, the last 30 years and they do a great job for us with certain wines. We come this way, another area for our red and white liqueurs. You can see these are all old, really old um, ex whiskey, brandy and bourbon barrels. Really important that they're not ex red wine barrels or white wine barrels for fortifieds. Uh, we need the freshness of the oak coming through. And the only way you can get that with old barrels is um, they have to have been used for spirits um, for their first 25, 30 years. And then uh, my father used to purchase them from uh, uh, wineries in the Eastern States or some distilleries um, back in the 1940s and 50s. And so did my grandfather. Some came out from these ones that my grandfather made that we showed you earlier, came from Glenfiddich in Scotland. And they were large barrels that were broken down um, to become small quarter casts, as we call them, like 180 litres. But English oak is the most wonderful timber for white liqueurs, um, such as Pedro Zemenez and um, even muskets, but liqueur Vidalo, Pedro Zemenez in particular, and for sherries when they were made years ago. And what we've done in some cases, we've replaced the ends of the barrels with uh, fresher oak that's only 25, 30 years old. But the main part of the barrel is, um, was made in the 1940s. And that will go on for uh, decades and decades. Um, no reason at all when they're out of the weather why they can't last a long time. There's some individual vintages of our PXs. Um, and down that line as well. Uh, we would spend probably about, um, it's our old screw press that we haven't used for about uh, 28 years now, but used to do a great job for us. Um, old brandy barrels that uh, make up our PX, our white liqueur uh, bourbon barrels for our liqueur Shiraz, which just seem to work a bit better for the, for the flavour components that we look for in liqueur Shiraz even though I'm not into flavour components. Um, and these up here, which we use for some of our rare tawny as well, which again are just quarter casts. They look pretty bad on the outside, but they're beautiful on the inside. Um, no chemicals used in them at all. They're washed out with, if they are washed out, which is very rare, um, the wine always has to be cleaned before it goes in. Uh, they're washed out with hot water and steam. Um, and then wines are put straight back in. The whole idea is to keep these barrels reasonably full. You can have some ullage, it is perfectly fine. And on our top layers of barrels, the warmest part of the building, we may deliberately keep barrels on serious levels of ullage. So airspace that may be of 40 or 50 percent and that way the wines can age a bit faster and be more concentrated and we would use them for our blending and you can see that is more than the angel's share down there on the floor um, a serious leak in one of our barrels unfortunately it's at the bottom which makes our job a bit more difficult another stack here that we have of um, of our 78 PX blends. Um, so individual vintages that we use for blending that make up the components for our 78 PX that I've spoken about before. Um, and then through to our puncheons, uh, which are in the old language about 100 gallons, so close to four, 60 for 80 litres, up to 500 litres, or vary a little bit. Uh, some of our cobwebs. And then 
this is where I sit to get away from it all when I've had enough of um, uh, of work for the day. So it is true we all have a place where we where we sit and get away from it. It's either the bottom of the vineyard, which is about half a um, which is about a kilometre away, um, or it's right here between stacks of barrels. The aroma is wonderful. Um, you sort of get used to it after a while, but when you first walk in the building, it's, um, it sort of hits you. So we open up the doors and make sure that we can breathe. Uh, but a beautiful place to work. And uh, these little areas will always remain uh, for me to be uh, really special memories. Memories that uh, make up a lifetime of winemaking. Another leaky barrel down there, which we're trying to fix. And the problem is we need to remove about 35 of them to get to that one. This is where we sometimes do our tastings, um, our long table tastings, where people are standing um, and doing blending trials. Uh, we've done a few of those in the barrel room. They work really well for people, just to get an understanding of what's involved with blending. You can never really replicate what we go through um, in actual detail to blend a fortified. Um, and I know quite often when I was doing uh, fortified sessions down for winemaking stu uh, students in Margaret River, they would ask the question at the end of the fortified session, uh, what are you actually looking for in the final blend? And the answer is, uh, I can't tell you because I can't describe it. Um, it's purely, I'm not trying to be smart about it at, at all. It's purely an intuitive thing. And that's what my grandfather and father was trying to tell me. That I actually can't describe what I look for. Um, I just know when it's right and when it's not right. And um, when I say I know it, I know when it's right. Well, not right. Um, we, we're always learning in the process each day, but there is something special when it comes together and you immediately get that wonderful feeling of uh, that the balance has been achieved. But trying to describe that to someone, um, I simply can't do it. So this is inside part of our fortified room, which takes up, like I said, most of our winter months. But uh, probably all up about four months of the year is spent in here, uh, making sure that um, barrels are fairly full, alcohol levels are checked, and then the blending process continues. This is what we call Solero blending. So we use a, com a combination of Solero blending and what we call rack and return, which is being able to move wine out of barrel into our bottling, bottling tank or blending tank, and then be able to make any adjustments we need to make to alcohol or to other blends to introduce to that wine, and then return them back into the same oak. And that's done all within three or four days. So welcome to my workspace. Hi, James Tallyansic here from uh, Tallyansic Wines in the Swan Valley in Western Australia, talking about Pedro Zemenez de Pure, what we call Rare Pedro, our 1978 Solero uh, Pedro Zemenez. It's, um, this is the vineyard planted in 1900, um, has enormous historical significance to the Swan Valley and we've had an incredible relationship with the Rowe family over this time, something like over five decades we've been purchasing the fruit. Um, it's been a big part of our lives, our, our winemaking lives for my father and, and also myself. Um, as a young kid I would be helping my father cart fruit out um, and Pedro Zemenez is a a long bunch, very similar to Sultanas in a way, but 
but a little bit bigger. And on the years where it's allowed to ripen to almost raisins, it produces wines like this. Years of blending, years of maturing. The average age is now over 25 years. The base wine is 1978. And whenever you see the word Solero on the label, um, or Solera, um, it means that it's blended. It's not from a single vintage which is the only way to make these wines. The luxury of a number of years blended over a period of time to produce a wine that's incredibly complex and multi-layered, still has to have a degree of freshness to it, even though it's really old and really concentrated. Um, but from the beginning of the palate to the very end, what we're looking for is consistency, not that interruption that we get with young whites or reds, um, where they take years in a bottle to achieve this. This is all about achieving it from the time the wine is bottled. So, Pedro Zemenez liqueur, what we call rare Pedro, from 1978 Solero. I hope you enjoy it.